We are studying on the Holy Spirit and we are understanding what it is and that power. Did you all learn anything from last yeah. week? Amen. Amen. So we're going to now, last week was an introduction, but we're going to start to dig deeper into this so that we can understand and, and clear up some of the things that we may have heard or learned or been taught over the years about the Holy Ghost that may not always necessarily have been true or there may be some moves of the Spirit that you experienced and you didn't really know what that was or what was happening. We're going to talk tonight specifically about uh, praying in the Spirit and speaking in tongues, what that is, why we do it, and is it lawful as a believer to do so in a general assembly like this? It is safe to say that in our humanity, uh, we often reject what we don't understand. As human beings, we have a tendency to reject what we cannot make sense of in our humanity. Not only that, but we often fear what we can't make sense of or what we don't seem to understand. And so we will shy away from it from the, for the fact that we are trying to understand it from a human perspective. If you look at your life, the majority of things that you are connected to in your life, you are connected to because you have an understanding of it. You are connected to people in your life who you feel you can understand. And we reject things and people who we don't seem to have a connection or who we can't watch this, figure it out. <laughs> we are good at trying to figure people out. We are good at trying to figure things out. And when we can't do that, as humans, the main thing we do is reject it or we pull away from it. And so we have a tendency to shy away from it or to move ourselves. That is often where we find ourselves with the move of the Holy Spirit. Oftentimes, the move or the baptism of the Holy Spirit or speaking in tongues or casting out devils is fearful and rejected by people because no one has taken time to break down the understanding of what has happened. How many of you know that if you came into a service and someone just came up to you and just started laying hands on you and speaking in tongues without you knowing what's happened, your first reaction would be to reject it. Because there is not an understanding. That's why for many of you, you'll realize when I'm praying for you here, a lot of times I'll say, can I lay hands on you? Or do you mind if I lay hands on you? Because the spirit of God, watch this, is not aggressive. He's sweet. Come on now. Come on now. Woo, God Almighty. Yes, God. Yes, God. He is sweet. Yes, God. He is a gentleman. Yes, he is. He's not going to force himself on you if you don't want to receive yes, it. But we have gotten away from understanding and teaching on it that we present the Holy Spirit as an aggressive force. Uh -huh. And we make people feel bad for not receiving it when the fact is they want to receive it, they just don't understand what it is. Oh, I'm preaching early already. So we have to bring understanding to what the Holy Spirit is. So it is often frightening or unwelcome or an unwelcome experience because for years we have tried to make sense of the Spirit from the natural. Ooh, God Almighty. We have been left to understand the move of the Holy Spirit from a natural perspective. Go to 1 Corinthians, uh, put a marker in, in chapter 14, but go to 1 Corinthians 2 and 14. It's good already. Yes, it is. 1 Corinthians 2 and 14. This is going to help you with what you can't seem to connect with maybe when you are in church or when the Lord is moving or the Spirit is moving and you're saying, why can't I connect with it? Why can't I seem to get into it? This is what it says in 1 Corinthians 2 and 14. Everybody there? Yeah. It said, everybody there? You know I like talking back. Yeah. Okay, here we go. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, yeah. for they are foolish unto him. So he is saying that in our natural, mm -hmm. the things of God don't make sense to our flesh. Yes, God. So we often initially will reject them. Uh -huh. Then it goes on to say, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Yeah. You see that? Yes, God. So what it is saying is that the things of God cannot only be understood in our flesh. Uh -huh. There is only so far you can go in the understanding of God and the move of God in your flesh. Yes, God. You got to have something greater, yes, which God. is the spirit of God yes, that brings understanding. Yes, because it says the things of the spirit are only 
only spiritually discerned. So you have to get into the spirit in order to understand the spirit. So one of the most controversial areas and defining uh, factors when it comes to the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the evidence of that which is speaking in tongues. The Bible talks and Acts 2 as our foundation for this series because in that we have the experience that many refer to as the upper room experience where it says they were all in one place on one accord and suddenly, I can't yes, even God. just talk about that scripture without getting excited, and suddenly the sound of a great mighty rushing wind came in and filled the temple and it says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. So this was the initiation of the move of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. Now for many, we, some of us, let me see how I can say this nicely. Some of us speak in tongues and don't even know why we don't do it. Even know why. That's the truth. Some of us have been filled with the Holy Ghost and told that we need it, but don't understand where it came from and why we do it and frankly what it is. Some will say that it is unlawful, it is unnecessary. They will say it's something you're not supposed to do in a corporate setting. You're only supposed to do it in your the quietness of your home or in your car. But I'm going to get controversial tonight and dispel some of those myths. Oh, I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you tonight. Because what we do, Pastor Analysis, is we will read a portion of a scripture. That's it. A portion of it. And make it truth. Without going any deeper. I feel the Holy Ghost creeping up my back, man. What are we doing? Look at somebody say, you got to read the whole book. Not only that, but watch this. You have to study beyond what you read. Oh, God Almighty. You got to study the word. You got to get deeper. And that's why it's important to come to a setting and be connected to a setting like this. Where you can bring some clarity and understanding to what you're reading. I know we think we can just have our own personal church, but you got to go somewhere where you can get some deeper knowledge and understanding of the word of God. So we're going to talk about that tonight. First Corinthians 14, beginning at the second verse, beginning at the second verse. Y'all tell me, are y'all, are y'all learning? Are you? Okay. Okay. All right. 1 Corinthians 14. Now we're going to jump throughout uh, different verses here. And I want you to write this down and write these scriptures down. I'm going to give you some other things to read. And I'm telling you, the reason I feel so led to share this is because prophetically, there is going to be such a move of God that happens within this ministry. I believe, glory to God. I believe that when we all come into a clear understanding, there is going to be such a unity that takes place. My God, have mercy. And so we are laying, look at somebody say, we're laying foundation. Many ministries even start and they don't lay the foundation. And how many of you know no matter what else changes, the foundation stays the same. And hey, as long as we can stick to the foundation, look at somebody say, as long as you can go back to the foundation, you can build again. Hey, good God Almighty. As long as you keep the foundation, you can always build again. And that, wait a minute, I gotta stay on task. Watch your voice. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I get excited. And that is prophetic even in your life. That as long as your foundation is right, you can always recover. Woo! God Almighty. As long as you have a solid foundation, you can always build again. Look at somebody say, I can always start again. Woo! God, that's a whole other word for a whole other night. As long as the foundation. So we are building foundation. We are building foundation. We are building foundation. First Corinthians 14, beginning at the second verse. Let's slow walk this. And I'm reading uh, whatever translation you are, trying to follow along with me. It says in, in the second verse, for any who speaks in tongues, you see that? Does not speak to people, but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the spirit. Now I'm in verse three. But the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging and comfort. So you might want to write that down, that when prophecy comes, it comes to do three things. It comes to strengthen, it comes to encourage, 
It comes to comfort, and I'm going to add one more. It also comes to correct. Come on, that's Woo. it. Wait a minute, wait that's a minute. It. Wait, we don't like that. Oh, no, no. no. Prophesy to me about houses and land and money, but don't tell me that's what it. I'm doing wrong. God. But it also comes to correct. So prophecy comes to strengthen. Prophecy comes to encourage. Prophecy comes to comfort. To correct. I'm going to add one more in there. Is that all right? And it also comes to confirm. Come on now. Come on now. Again, why you have to be connected to a resource and a knowledge that is greater than you. Because sometimes you need someone, a man of God, a woman of God, who can confirm right. what the Lord has already spoken that's to you. Right. Yeah. Okay, so that's what prophecy comes to do. All right, verse 4. Anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves. But the one who prophesies edifies the church. Yes, God. Verse 5. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues. But I would rather you have prophecy. Wow. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues. Uh -huh. Unless someone interprets so that the church may be edified. This now this is what we will do with this scripture. This we will take this scripture uh, and say that it means that Paul is telling us not to speak in tongues. Uh -huh. If you ever, and this is not to offend anyone who's been a part of a ministry like that, but if you ever go to a ministry who doesn't believe in speaking in tongues, this is the scripture they will use. Uh -huh. They will say that speaking in tongues only edifies you and speaks mysteries that we all can't understand. Uh -huh. But how many of you know, you don't need to understand what I'm That's saying right. to the Lord. That's right. <laughs> God, That's mercy. Right. That's right. It is my personal conversation right. with him. Oh, come on, somebody. Why do you need to understand my conversation to the Lord? Okay? So that's the first part of it. So we would take it to mean that. But the irony of that is that in the 18th verse, Paul says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. So why in one verse would he say, that it is mysteries and it only edifies us personally and that the one who prophesies is greater. But then he says, I speak in tongues more than all of you. Let me bring some understanding to this for you. Because we will oftentimes debate the scriptures and make it look like God's word is a contradiction. Not so. The devil is a liar. There is always a uniting force and that's why we have to study the word of God, what we're doing tonight. This is, is where we get it wrong. Paul was not saying, do not speak in tongues. The book of Corinthians is Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. Yes. Now, Corinthians comes after the Pentecost experience. So the church at Corinth was already working in the spiritual gifts. Yes. They were already speaking in tongues. And Paul's letter to the church at Corinth goes through several things regarding the church. It talks about administration in the church. It talks about loving and respecting one another. So he is basically bringing order to the church at Corinth. When he gets here, y'all following me? Okay. When he gets here to these verses and he starts... Ooh, I'm sorry. I see the end before the beginning. I'm sorry. When he gets to these verses and he begins to speak in tongues... He is bringing order back to the church. Yes, because at this time in the church of Corinth, there was a sector of people within that church who when prophecy was going forward from the man of God, they would be speaking in tongues louder than the prophecy that was coming forth. So what he was saying to them was that when prophecy is going forth, it is the greater gift at the time because it comes not just to edify you, but it comes to edify the whole body. Yes, stay God, with me, yes, stay with God, me, stay yes, with me. God, this is good. So he was separating the difference. And he was saying that what the Bible says later, that the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Yes. Let me show you what that means. If I am up prophesying to you, the spirit is not schizophrenic. He's not bipolar. He's not out of order. And so if I am prophesying to you, the spirit connects with the spirit. Let me do an example for you. Come up here real quick. 
I'm going to show you how it looks out. Ooh, we learning tonight. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I'm going to show you what it looks like, what Paul was saying that was out of order. He was speaking to the people who were using their gift greater than the set gift of the house for the moment. Let me show you what that looks like. Just begin to speak a, a word of encouragement. Go ahead. Come on, Pastor. Come on. 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 But what we do in the charismatic church is we speak out, we have no order, and we blame it on the Holy Spirit. We blame it on the Holy Spirit. So what he was saying is that if you are being filled with the Holy Spirit, if you are being used at the Holy Spirit, the Spirit in you ought to recognize when it's time to calm down. Oh, let me help you with here. You are not that far gone in the Spirit. He has not set on you that heavy that you don't know when it's time to stop. Oh, come on here. Come on here. Come on here. We got to bring order to this because there are churches that are running rapid and blaming it on the Holy Spirit. But somebody say he's a God of order. So what he was explaining is that the greater, the greater gift is the prophecy that is coming forth comes to edify the entire body. He was never saying that we are not to speak in tongues as personal edification. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. So he says in verse 5, I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather you have prophecy. So he's saying, I, would, I want all of you to have the gift of speaking in tongues. But when the word of prophecy is coming forth, I would much rather you all receive that as a corporate word for the house. Make sense? All right, let's keep going. When I tell you, I can see us months from now shouting the victory and having Holy Ghost fits in here because we are getting understanding. Y'all don't want it. Y'all don't want it. <laughs> so that's what he was sharing, okay? So anyone who says they are so swept away by the Spirit or couldn't control it or had to speak out, is oftentimes out of order. Now, I am from the old school church. Now, I'm young, but I'm old. <laughs> I am young, but I'm old. And I just believe that at some point, we have to bring order back to the church. Do you know that somebody can miss the prophetic word because of confusion that has broken out in the church? And church is the only place where you can do anything and get away with it. Ooh, church is the only place where you can cut up, act the fool, toss rose, and nobody says anything about it. And we believe in the powerful move of the Holy Ghost. I believe in being drunk in the spirit. I believe that the Lord will use you. But I also believe he is a God of order. He is a God of order. Okay. So let's go on. 1 Corinthians 14 beginning at verse 30. Let's read there. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 30. And if a revelation comes to someone who is sitting down, the first speaker should stop. This is what Paul is speaking to the church of Corinth. That is just what I explained to you. If me as the apostle, the pastor of this house, begins to speak a word of prophecy, there should be no other voice that is greater than that word at the time. That's right. That's Does that make sense? Amen. Okay. So that's what he's saying in verse 31. For you can all prophesy in turn so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. Okay. The spirits of prophets are subject to the controls of prophets. For God, everything I just said to you, God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the congregations of the Lord's people. Write this down. The spirits of prophets are subject to the control of prophets. And that's why we got to cast down and bind up these witchcraft devils that want to prophesy you to you in the parking lot after you just got a word in the house. Oh, come on, let's talk in here. I come to do work tonight. I come to do work tonight. If you have received the word in the house from the set gift of the house, it is out of order for somebody to pull you in a corner 
and want to share more word with you. Oh, y'all looking at me crazy. Y'all don't believe that. Y'all don't believe that. Y'all don't believe that. There is a spirit of order, and that's why people are leaving confused because the word you got from the set gift is different from the word you got in the parking lot, and now you're left to go home and figure it out for yourself. Look at somebody say, the spirit of the prophet woo, is subject to the prophet. Oh, it's running crazy in the church, and we got to cut it down. We got to cut it down. Okay. Now, there are times where you will be uh, sanctioned. There are times when Pastor Denalis, I may finish ministering and the, and the Lord may uh, begin to speak through another gift in the house and the order which she does so gracefully is to be sanctioned or to be given permission yes. to share with the house. Yes. Yes. So, and, and I'm, I'm sharing this with you because I have a very strong, strong prophetic and deliverance ministry and as you continue to unite with this ministry, you're going to see several different manifestations of the Spirit of God. And part of that may also be rebuke. That's right. Because the devil also shows up in praise. And the Bible says the devil also knows how to speak in tongues. And so you have to be very careful. My job as the leader of this house is to safeguard this house. And not just let any kind of spirit break out and run rampant. So there may be times where somebody may become that is used by a spirit of demonic force. And may begin to speak up or cause the confusion in the service and you will see me immediately speak right to that spirit uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's say it the Lord rebuke you I'm not pointing at you but you know <laughs> no. no we can't be afraid of devils Woo! and we're so afraid of hurting people's feelings and them not coming back the devil is alive we gotta speak to the devil and cancel his assignment at the root somebody say the devil is a liar so I got to bring understanding because you have to understand the things that you're seeing and that you've seen in church and that may happen. So you understand, watch this, even how to pray. That's right. See, the That's devil right. want to act up now. Loose here. That's no, right. I'm, not. <laughs> I'm messing with you. But you have to understand it so you know how to pray. Okay? I'm slow walking this because I want, I want you all to get this. Okay? Let's keep going. Okay? So the spirit of prophets is subject to the control of prophets. Paul makes this statement to let the Corinthian believers know that the Holy Spirit, like I said before, does not force himself. And only the flesh or the devil, not the Holy Spirit, will cause disorder. Yes. Yes. The Spirit does not cause disorder. So as the Spirit flows, if the word of prophecy is coming forward, there is enough control that the Holy Spirit gives us to recognize when we are to give way to the word of prophecy. And I speak now that this whole house will be filled with the Holy Ghost. Give me, just give me a moment. I speak it in Jesus' name. Somebody say it is so. Okay, let's keep going. So when Paul talks about this, in that scripture, he gives us two reasons by which we speak in tongues. He says the first is personal. It is direct communication to God, where often we will pray in the spirit, or we will worship in the spirit. You will see during times when we're worshiping, I may begin to sing in tongues. Okay, or uh, as we're worshiping, you may hear the person next to you begin to worship and their language will go from English to speaking in tongues. So he says it is for personal edification. The root of living and existence is based upon communication. And that is the same thing in the spirit. So when we pray in tongues, it is our direct communication to God. Oh, I'm going to get deeper for you. Then it also comes... As general edification to the body. Okay? So that will be when you will hear somebody's voice that may rise greater than everybody else's. Um, if the Lord is moving, he may use somebody who begins to speak in tongues that is coming as a word of prophecy. The order in that is that the house must go silent to hear the word. Oh, let me help you. The house must go silent to hear what the Lord is saying. So you will see in times when that happens, I will stop the musicians, I will stop all walking, because the Lord wants to say, hey, whoo, there it is again, I'm sorry. The Lord wants to say something. So the house must go silent so that we can hear what the Lord is saying. So he says it comes for personal edification and it also comes for a general word to the house of God. Now here's how that works. The Lord may use one individual or he may use two individuals in that situation. 
He may call Sister Yvonne to be begin to speak in tongues, but he may have Sister Martin be the one to interpret it. There are individuals and spiritual gifts, and one of those gifts is the gift of interpretation of tongues. So as she's speaking in tongues, once she finishes, you may hear the response come in the natural. Because you must understand in the natural and the spirit. And when the Lord wants to speak, he doesn't speak to the natural first. Sorry, he speaks to the spirit. So he's going to speak in the spirit first. Some of y'all still... Some of y'all still holding on to like, Pastor, I don't really understand where you're going. Oh, I'm going to help you. Oh, I'm, oh, I'm going to help you. We're going to go a little deeper. Okay? So that word will come in the spirit first, and then it will be translated in the natural when it is a word of corporate edification. Okay? But we also desire the baptism of the Holy Ghost and being able to speak in tongues. And I'm going to tell you why. Here's the foundation of that. Romans 8 and 26. Y'all let me know if I'm going too fast. I know you write notes down. And these are scriptures you should be going back to read these as well. Romans 8 and 26. I'm going to read it out of the NIV version. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. What helps us in our weakness? The Spirit. The Spirit. Did it say the natural? Did it say your attitude? Your will? Your way? No, it said what? The Spirit helps us in our weakness. Let's go on. We do not know what we ought to pray for. Oh, let's dig in there. But the Spirit himself intercedes on our behalf. I'm going to say that scripture again. We do not know how to pray. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us. That is why it is a struggle for some of us to pray. That is why it's a struggle for some of us when we are going through something to even know where to start in prayer. Because we are trying to pray from the natural. But the Bible says the Spirit intercedes on our behalf. So we must learn how to not only pray in the understanding which is our natural, but we must also learn how to pray in the Spirit. Because there is only so far you can go in your natural. <laughs> Woo, that's good. I, if I'm going too fast, tell me. But you got to get this. You got to understand because some of us are coming up to a wall in prayer and we're saying, I don't have a zeal and I don't know how to pray and I don't know what to pray for. That's because you have exhausted your praying in the natural. And now you have to move to the spirit. God have mercy. And if you are only looking at your Christian experience from the natural, you will never get the fullness of God. Because there is only so far we can go in the natural. At some point, you got to move to the, to the Spirit. You have to move to the Spirit. So that is why for some of us, our desire for God only goes to a certain capacity because we only know Him. Ooh, I'm sorry, I get excited. We only know Him from a natural experience. But we have to now not only know him in the understanding, but also in the spirit. I'm going to show you why. I got word to help you right there. So if you are ever going to experience God on a deeper level, you have got to get in the spirit. And that is the issue. We have too many surface believers who just want to know him just enough. <laughs> I just want to know you enough just to feel safe. I just want to know you enough just to know if I need to pray, you're there. Look at somebody say, you got to go deeper. Oh, come on, tell somebody, you, you need something that's going to keep you. You need something that's going to keep you, so you have to go deeper. Somebody shout deeper. You got to go deeper. You have to go deeper. We have enough surface Christians. And that's why you have to get delivered every week. Because you are only knowing him on the serpent. You, you got to have your feet planted. Good God Almighty. In it. So you have to go deeper. This is the season for us to go deeper, which means you have to now get beyond just knowing God in your understanding. And if you are just looking to know God from a place of what you understand, run now. Oh, let me say it again. If your relationship with God is only based upon what you can understand, you leave while I'm talking. Because there is elements of God that we will never understand from our natural. Woo! Because
because what? His ways are not our ways. And his thoughts are not our thoughts. And so if that is so, how can you understand a spiritual God from a natural perspective? There's got to be something working inside of you that helps you understand the spirit move. Maybe somebody say, get in the spirit, get in the spirit, get in the spirit. You cannot pray strictly from your understanding. Let me say it again. You cannot pray strictly from your understanding. And if you know anything about life, there's a whole lot of things in life I don't understand. There's a whole lot of things I can't seem to make sense of. But the Spirit intercedes on our behalf. And so you have to understand <laughs> that there are things you will never understand in your natural. And that is where the Spirit kicks in. You know why I love speaking in tongues? Because I can pray and I don't have to understand it. I don't have to understand the way he's making. I don't understand how he's going to do it. I don't even have the words to say. But he gives us the spirit to intercede on our behalf. And as long as you try to understand a spirit move from a natural perspective, you will always remain on the surface. If you, if, if you want to know the deep things of God, you have to go into the deep. Isaiah 55 and 8, it says... For my ways are not your ways. Yes, my thoughts are not your thoughts, declares the Lord. Yes, so that is why he gives us the language of the spirit to communicate. Mm -hmm. Well, what am I saying? Well, what does it mean? There goes that understanding coming in us trying to figure out. He said, don't worry about it. Just know I'm doing it. <laughs> Look at somebody say, just know I'm doing it. Oh, I can't hear anybody talking in here. So as long as you try to understand this from a human experience, you will limit your experience with God. So there are two ways we must pray. We must pray in the understanding and we must also pray in the spirit. We must pray in the understanding, meaning we must pray from a natural perspective in our English language, but we must also learn to pray in the spirit. Those of you that, that have ever prayed in the experience or experienced that, help me testify that there is something that happens when you pray in the spirit. Yes. Woo! There was a different experience with God that happens when you pray in the spirit. But I don't even have to understand it or know what's happening. I just, hey, glory to God. I just yield to the spirit. Let me give you a, a, a scripture for that. So praying in tongues also gives us the confidence that we don't have in our humanity. There was a strength that we get by praying in the spirit that we don't have in our humanity. If I pray from my humanity, I'll get discouraged praying about what I don't understand. Oh, I know that was a lot. Let me, let me do that again. If I pray only in the natural, I will get discouraged about what I'm praying about because I don't know how you're going to do this. I don't know how the way is going to be made. Have you ever prayed in the back of your head? You said, I wonder if this is really working. I wonder if you, I wonder, I wonder if this is really working. Well. I wonder if you, I wonder if We are trying to pray and figure it out, which is why he gives us not only the understanding, but the spirit. Okay. Is this making sense to you all? Y'all still with you? Okay. 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 Good. Okay. First Corinthians 14, beginning at the 14th verse. For if I pray in a tongue, I'm in the 14th verse of first Corinthians 14. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. There goes another scripture that we will use to say, what is the sense in praying in the spirit? That's, that would sound real good as an argument scripture, wouldn't it? But when you pray in tongues, your mind is unfruitful. Okay? Then he says in verse 15, so what shall I do? He says, I will pray in my spirit, but I will also pray in my understanding. So that is the proof. That there are two dimensions of prayer. He says, I will pray in the spirit, but I will also pray in the understanding. Okay? He also says, I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with the understanding. Which lets us know that speaking in tongues is not only good for prayer, it's also good for worship. Because he says, I will sing in the understanding, but I will also sing in the spirit. And so there are occasions in worship where your worship will go from the understanding and the natural to the spirit. Oh, come on in here. Come on in here. Come on in here. So it shows us that there are two dimensions to God. 
There is the natural, but there is also the spiritual realm, okay? 1 John 5 and 14, I'm giving you a lot of scriptures, I know. But take these home and, and read them. 1 John 5 and 14. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. Hey, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. I'm going to say it again. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to Ava's will, according to Ellen's will, according to Yvonne's will, no, according to who? His will. He will answer us. So if we have to pray according to his will, but his ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts, how can we in our natural pray his will? Let me do that again. He says, we are to pray according to his will. But if we cannot understand his ways in our natural, and his thoughts are not our thoughts, how can we pray his will if we don't know it? Oh, we got to get in the spirit. <laughs> Good God Almighty! And that's why we're frustrated trying to understand the will of God for our life because we are only trying to pray it from a natural perspective. But it is in the spirit, I'm sorry, that we understand the will of God. And so we got a lot of frustrated people saying, I don't know what God wants me to do. I don't know what his will is for my life. I don't know what my purpose is. That's because we're trying to understand that God who is not natural, he is spiritual. God Almighty. So you have to get into the spirit because it's in the spirit that he will begin to reveal it to you. There are times that I will begin to worship and pray and speak in tongues and things will just begin to reveal to me and just begin to come to me. That's because I have moved from my natural understanding into the spirit realm. Hey, God. The mysteries of God. The mysteries of God. So we have a lot of frustrated believers because we cannot pray God's will from a humane perspective. We have to pray it and understand it from the spirit. For many of us, we have reached the peak of God in our understanding. That's why we have people that say stuff like, church isn't for me anymore. Or, or I get more on my own than I do at the church. That's because we have left ourselves to our natural understanding. Because when you, oh how can you get tired of a God, God who's always speaking something new in the spirit? Oh Woo! Thank you. Give me a clap on that right there. How, how can you get tired of a God? That's because you're looking for him in the natural and he's not there. Oh, hey, wait a minute. He has moved into the spirit. Now that's not to say, because I want you guys to say, Pastor Cam said, Lord, don't walk with me in the natural. No, he's, he's with you. But there is a different dimension of him in the spirit. And at some point, you got to get off the milk and start eating some meat. At some point, you got to move from the natural and move into the spirit. Because the spirit searches the deep things of God. So we have to understand that this is all a part of the moving and the power that God gives us. And the devil has us tricked to reject a deeper power that can work inside of us. He has us tricked into thinking we don't need that and you don't need to do that and you can know God and be saved without that. And that is very true. But why would you want, not want a deeper power? Woo! Why would you not want a deeper experience with the God you serve? But as long as you are trying to understand it from your humane perspective, you will always stay in a stagnant place. But I believe that the Holy Spirit is going to flood this place. Somebody say it is so. Hallelujah. That he's going to begin to reveal the myth. He's going to begin to reveal the mysteries to you. And for many of you, you have lived life not understanding things that have happened to you, not understanding things that are going on. But when you can get in the spirit and say we walk by faith and not by sight, you will understand everything that is happening in your life is for a purpose. I'm in such a place of no stress and no fear and no worry because I no longer look at things in the natural. When something happens or doesn't go my way, the first thing I say is let me get in the spirit. Lord, what are you doing here? Hey! Because it don't make sense to go in my natural. This, this right here.
right here don't make sense. Yes, God. I, I don't know why this is happening. But when you get in the spirit, you can go through with confidence because you understand it's working for my good. Hey, glory. And he will reveal it to you. He will reveal his plan and his will for you. But you have got to get in the spirit. He has not, he has not stopped speaking to you because you've sinned. Because you're so far gone. Because he doesn't know your voice. No, he hears your voice. He just needs to hear you in the spirit. Woo! God have mercy. So we have got to move. And that is what the baptism of the Holy Spirit does. It gives us a greater power and a greater understanding. To understand the mysteries of God. Is this helping anybody tonight? Somebody clap your hands and give God praise.